thank you all for inviting me to be here with you all today during your conference. Again, I'm Joshua Coleman. I'm the State Outreach Coordinator for Texas Farm Service Agency. And of course, it's a, again, delight to be here with you all today to share some updates with you all about our programs here in Texas. And so we will cover quite a few things today with our program. So we'll cover our regular traditional ag programs in addition to some information on our farm loan programs. And so if you do have any questions as we go throughout the presentation today, feel free to just enter those into the chat and we'll be sure to address those as, at the end of the presentation. So first, starting off, just the update of where we are in terms of COVID. USA, we are allowing some service centers to have limited visitors by appointment only. And so for those of y'all that may have done work with us over the past year, you do know that a lot of our, we are practicing social distancing, masks are required inside of the offices in an effort to make sure that we still can provide services to our producers. And so while some of our service centers are open to limited visitors, we do still continue to work with producers by phone, email, and other online tools. And so just be sure to reach out to your local FSA office before you stop by, just to be sure about how they may be conducting business there locally. So there are over 2,100 county offices across the nation with every county being serviced by a USDA service center. There are staff here that are willing and happy to help you with any questions that you may have um, and participation with the USDA program. There's a beginning farmer coordinator that has been identified in every state. Here in Texas, I serve as the beginning farmer champion for Farm Service Agency. And so if you do have any questions or you are thinking about getting into farming, feel free to reach out to me and we'll be sure to kind of share some information with you and to get you in touch with your local staff who can help you with reaching your goals that you have set for your operation and for yourself. These beginning farmer rancher coordinators, um, we have one in NRCS as well as Rural Development and the Risk Management Agency. They are a great resource in sharing helpful information and guidance for working with USDA agencies as a beginning farmer. And so you can find additional information online at farmers.gov forward slash new farmers to just see what all options and information we do have available for you all. And if you haven't visited your local service center before, we do encourage you to call and schedule an appointment to stop by to just meet the staff there locally and to see what opportunities may be available for you. And so you can find your local service center by visiting farmers.gov forward slash service dash locator. And so when you visit your local office, you can talk with both FSA and NRCS about programs that may be of interest to you and what you'll need to get started. On your first visit to the office, here are some things that you should know prior to your first visit and what you should be prepared to provide. So you will need to provide your proof of identity. So this will either be your driver's license, social security number or card. And if you are operating as a business or an entity, your IRS employer identification number. You will need a copy of the recorded deed for your land or survey plat. Or if you are leasing a property, you will need a copy of the rental or lease agreement for that land. You don't have to own land to participate in FSA programs, but you just must be able to substantiate that you are able to make the management decisions for that farm. If you are operating as an entity, you will need to provide the articles of incorporation. Or if you are a trust at, at, or an estate, you'll need to provide the full documents that go along with that type of arrangement. Or if there is a partnership agreement that you operate under, then we'll need the full partnership agreement as well. Having these items prepared and with you for your first visit with FSA will help to ensure a smooth, easy, and quick process for you in getting started. Once those items are reviewed, FSA can register your farm or ranch in the FSA database. So your local staff will create a map outlining farm and ranch boundaries with acreage figures and provide you with a farm number. So having a farm number will allow you to access key USDA programs, vote in FSA county committee elections, and receive routine program notifications. Regarding operators on Ayers property, in Texas, one of the states that has adopted the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. That allows us to be able to establish a farm for those producers or issue a farm number for them who may not be able to provide an owner verification or lease agreement. 
And so you may be able to provide alternative documents to substantiate that you may be in the general control of the farming operation on any property that's considered heirs property. So some of the information that you can provide would be a court order verifying the land meets the definition of heirs property as defined in the UPHPA or a certification from your local record of deed that the recorded owner of the land is deceased and at least one heir has initiated a procedure to retitle the land. Now, in some cases, all producers may not have this information. And so there are some additional documents that you may be able to provide. So these may include a tenancy and common agreement that is approved by a majority of the owners that gives the individual the right to manage and control a portion or all of the land. You could also provide tax returns for the previous five years, showing the individual has an undivided farming interest. A self-certification that the individual has control of the land for purposes of operating a farm or, man or ranch may be acceptable. And any other documentation acceptable by the FSA County Office that establishes that the individual has general control of the farming operation. So that would include, but not limited to, an affidavit, affidavit from any owner stating that the individual has control of the land, a limited power of attorney giving the individual control of the land, or any council checks or receipts for rent payments and or operating expenses. So this is not an inclusive list of all the information that you could provide if you do operate on heirs property, but it kind of gives you an idea of some of the documents that you could provide. And so if you do fall into this situation um, where you may operate on heirs property and you do want to enroll in our programs or get a farm number just to get started, be sure to reach out to your local office and they can give you additional information on what will be required. The 2018 Farm Bill included legislation that is setting up what is the Heirs Property Relending Program. The Heirs Property Relending Program, also known as HPRP, will provide funds to eligible entities to relend with the purpose of assisting heirs to resolve ownership and succession issues on farmland with multiple owners. So once FSA selects these intermediary lenders, heirs can apply directly to those lenders for assistance. So HPRP, it is a loan and it will need to be repaid as directed by the 2018 Farm Bill. Intermediary lenders uh, will make loans to heirs who are individuals or legal entities with the authority to incur the debt and to resolve ownership and succession of a farm owned by multiple owners. They are also a family member or heir at law that's related by blood or marriage to the previous owner of the property, and they must agree to complete a succession plan. If you are an heir, you may use the loans to resolve title issues by financing the purchase or consolidation of property interest and financing costs associated with a succession plan. This may also include costs of buying out fractional interest of other heirs to clear the title, which includes closing costs, appraisals, title searches, surveys, preparing documents, mediation, and legal services. If you are an heir, you may not use loans under this program for any land improvement, development purpose, acquisition or repair of buildings, acquisition of personal property, payment of operating costs, payment of finder's fees, or similar costs. Once this program is announced and more information is available, you'll have a better idea of what things you may be able to get funding for, and a list of those eligible lenders will be available as well for you all that may need assistance through the Heirs Property Relending Program. So FSA has two major categories of offerings, working capital and disaster assistance also known as farm loan programs and farm programs. FSA has a variety of loan programs to meet different types of needs, whether it be for an improvement project, expanding an enterprise, getting started, or purchasing a farm. Farm programs has disaster programs for all types of producers and can help farmers recover during natural disasters or when there are serious economic disruptions 
such as the current pandemic. Farm Programs also has programs to offset the cost of organic certification and has low interest loans for commodity storage of all types from fluid milk to produce. So starting a little bit about our programs, one of the main things that producers can do is file a crop acreage report. So each year, USDA agencies collect data relating to crops through crop acreage reports. If you want to participate in many USDA programs, including crop insurance, safety net, conservation, and disaster assistance programs, you must file timely acreage reports to remain eligible for program benefits. Filing an accurate and timely acreage report for all crops and land uses, including failed acreage and prevented planted acreage, may prevent the loss of benefits. You can file crop acreage reports by filling out the FSA 578 form. Your local USDA service center staff can help by providing you with maps and deadlines to simplify the reporting process. To file an acreage report, you will need to provide the crop, crop type and intended use, the number of acres, a map with the approximate boundaries, planning date and planning pattern, and the producer shares. Additionally, you'll also need to provide the irrigation practices, so whether it's an irrigated or non-irrigated crop, and the acreage prevented from planting when applicable, and any other information that may be required by your local FSA office. And so if you have never filed an acreage report before, or you may be more curious about the process, be sure to reach out to your local FSA office, and they can be sure to get you set up and get your acreage report timely filed. Now to discuss a little bit about FSA's disaster program. Our non-insured crop disaster assistance program, also referred to as NAP, covers crops that are not insurable through a typical insurance agent. There is an administrative fee of $325 per crop, but this can be waived for beginning, socially disadvantaged, and limited resource producers. So some crops that may be eligible for this type of program may be fruit and vegetable crops, honeybee, honey produced by honeybees, and different things of that nature. And so reach out to your local FSA office to see what things may be covered in your area. The Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm Raised Fish Program, also known as ELAP, is for livestock producers and provides assistance for grazing losses on non-federal land additional costs in transporting water to livestock due to drought, and losses resulting from the additional costs associated with gathering livestock for treatment and inspection related to cattle tick fever. The Livestock Indemnity Program, also known as LIP, provides benefits to eligible livestock owners or contract growers for eligible livestock deaths in excess of normal mortality caused by an eligible loss condition. These include eligible adverse weather, eligible disease, and eligible attacks. Attacks must be by animals reintroduced into the wild by the federal government or protected by federal law, including wolves and avian predators. The Livestock Forage Disaster Program, also known as LFP, provides payments to eligible livestock owners and contract growers who have covered livestock and who are also producers of grazed forage crop acreage, including native and approved pasture land with a permanent vegetative cover for certain crops planted specifically for grazing. These must have suffered a loss of grazed forage due to a qualifying drought during a normal grazing period for the county. LFP also provides payments to eligible livestock owners or contract growers that have covered livestock and who are also producers of grazed forage crop acreage on range land managed by a federal agency if the eligible livestock producer is prohibited by the federal agency from grazing the normal permitted livestock on the managed range land due to a qualifying fire. Another loan that we'll also speak a little bit more about later is the Farm Storage Facility Loan Program, 
also known as SSFL. This is a low interest financing to assist with the purchase and or construction of storage, such as hay storage or produce storage. So it is important to note that with this program, the person that is applying for the loan must be the producer of the commodity that will be or take advantage of the storage. There is also support that's available for organic producers. The Organic Certification Cost Share Program, also known as OCCFP, provides organic producers and handlers with financial assistance to reduce the cost of organic certification by reimbursing a portion of their paid certification costs. Cost share reimbursements cover up to 50% of certification costs each year, paying farmers up to $500 to certify each of the scopes or categories, which are the same as crops, wild crops, livestock, and processed products or handling processes. The application period for 2021 has closed and the application period for 2022 has not yet been announced. For producers that want to submit a late filed OCCFP application for 2021, please contact your local FSA office for additional information. The Organic and Transitional Education and Certification Program, also known as OTECP, provides assistance for certified operations and transitional operations that incurred eligible expense in fiscal years 2020, 2021, and or 2022. This includes eligible certification expenses, eligible transitional expenses, educational event registration fees, and soil testing for micronutrient deficiencies. This new program is part of USDA's Pandemic Assistance for Producers Initiative. And the deadline to apply for OTECP is February 4th, 2022. Now we'll move into FSA's Farm Loan Program. FSA makes and services direct loans through supervised credit with funds from the US Treasury. FSA also offers loan guarantees for loans made by conventional lenders. FSA works one-on-one -on -one with an applicant to determine creditworthiness, their ability to repay, evaluate the farm business, and supervises them through the loan process. Applicants and borrowers maintain good and frequent communication with their FSA farm loan officer and team. Your loan officer will work to create the best solution for you in terms of payment schedule, accountability, loan terms, and disbursement of funds. FSA loan staff can provide the technical assistance and can answer questions, but it is important to understand that the borrower is ultimately responsible for the success of the operation. The FSA staff will work with you in filling out your application and applying. They have to. Please take advantage of their assistance when applying for a loan. Be realistic, honest, and detailed in your description of your personal and farm finances and your business plan and expenses. Decisions are made based on the information you provide, so it is important it is accurate. Many loan officers will recommend starting small and scaling up the operation. So it's important to note that FSA is supervised credit, so meaning that we're different from traditional credit. FSA is the lender of first opportunity for those who may not otherwise qualify for ag credit. Some of the eligibility requirements include being unable to obtain sufficient credit elsewhere, be a citizen or a legal resident alien, possess the legal capacity to incur the loan obligation, have acceptable credit history, and be the owner operator or tenant operator of a family farm. Additionally, you must not be delinquent on any federal debt. You must have the managerial ability for the type of loan requested. And you must not have caused the agency a loss by receiving debt forgiveness with some exceptions. It is important to note that the applicant must not have been convicted of planting, cultivating, growing, producing, harvesting, or storing a controlled substance within the last five years. 
So for direct loan applicants, FSA looks at the whole and global financial picture. So gross farm income and expenses, the owner cost of living and withdrawal, owner operator income, farm and personal debt payments. So bottom line, all our expenses and debts being paid, and is there any cash left? FSA can provide 100% of the financing needs, unlike commercial lenders. So let's take a look at what it takes to be eligible for a direct loan. So applicants must develop a realistic farm business plan that projects repayment ability for the loan and meet general eligibility criteria. You must provide adequate collateral for the loan and agree to take borrower training courses if required and graduate to private sector credit when able to do so. You must not exceed the restriction on years of eligibility and you must have the applicable education, training or farm experience that provides the reasonable prospects of success. For a farm ownership loan, you must have participated in the management of a farm or ranch for at least three years. Certain types of qualifications can reduce the three-year experience requirement. These include degrees, military experience, or mentorship. Years of experience must include three years of management decisions for production and operations and finances, and not just farm labor. So to learn more about what type of experience you have that may be counted, be sure to visit with your farm loan team and they can give you additional information and answer your questions. So these definitions here define the rules for participating in programs as well as priority pools of funding for other USDA programs. A beginning farmer, according to FSA, is a individual or entity who has not operated a farm or ranch for more than 10 years. They meet the loan eligibility requirements of the program to which he or she is applying. And for a farm operating loan, does not own a farm greater than 30% of the average size farm in the county. Note that that last one does not apply to socially disadvantaged producers. Social disadvantaged producers or historically underserved groups, as defined by law, are applicants who is a member of a socially disadvantaged group whose members have been subjected to racial, ethnic, or gender prejudice because of their identity as a member of a group without regard to their individual qualities. SDA groups are African Americans, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Hispanics, Asians, Pacific Islanders, and women. So some agencies have slightly different definitions of beginning farmer or rancher or prioritize pools differently. For example, NRCS's Environmental Quality Incentives Program does not give women extra weight in terms of competing for funding, but does for beginning farmers. There are also different provisions for FSA programs that vary from program to program, so be sure to visit with your local office about what types of support may be available for beginning farmers and ranchers or socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So just to recap, and to review the basics again, FSA is supervised credit, so the goal is to graduate. The five C's of credit are character, capital, collateral, condition, and capacity. So knowing your credit score, your credit report, your cash flow, and your farm finances will help you to have a successful plan for repayment and for success. So now we'll dig a little deeper into our farm loan program. So for our direct farm lo loan programs, we have farm ownership loans, we have operating loans, and micro loans. So for the interest rates for January 2022, which change from month to month, for farm ownership loans is 3%, and for operating loans is 2.125%. FSA also offers guaranteed loan programs, and there is a beginning farmer down payment loan program. So the 2018 Farm Bill increased the loan guarantee for beginning and underserved farmers from 90% to 95%. 
Direct farm operating loans can have terms up to 40 years with a maximum loan amount of $600,000. Direct operating loans can have terms up to seven years with a maximum loan amount of $400,000. Loan terms can be 12 months for annual operating loans. The microloan farm ownership loan can have terms up to 25 years with a maximum loan amount of $50,000. And the microloan operating loan can have a term up to seven years with a maximum loan amount of $50,000. And it can be 12 months for annual operating expenses. The Guaranteed Loan Program provides financing for both farm ownership and operating loans with purposes with the maximum loan amount of $1,825,000 for fiscal year 2022. FSA can guarantee the loan up to 95%. The beginning farmer down payment loan is designed to where the applicant contributes 5%, FSA finances 45%, and other financial institution finances 50%. So a note on the down payment loan program. This loan is usually used in combination with a traditional lender and FSA and can only be used by beginning, veteran, and historically underserved producers. It requires 5% down, but can save significant money in interest paid over the life of the loan and is often used to transition a farm to a new farmer from a family member. It is recommended that you speak to a loan officer about it since it works differently from other lending programs. Operating loans can be used within one year and they can be used for things such as feed, land rent, and seed, which are limited to one year terms. They can also be used to purchase equipment or livestock. These operating loans are repaid within one to seven years, and the limit for these is $400,000. Now let's take a look into some options for our farm ownership loan program. Ownership loans can be used to pay for land purchases, capital improvement, soil and water conservation, and loan closing and related expenses. Farm ownership loans can be repaid in up to 40 years and the loan limit for this program is $600,000. Microloans are limited to $50,000 and have a simpler application process and less paperwork. There are both ownership and operating microloans. Operating microloans can be used for all approved operating expenses authorized by FSA, such as initial startup expenses, seed, fertilizer, marketing, and livestock. Ownership loans can be used for approved expenses such as purchasing land or a farm, enlarging an existing farm, constructing buildings, or paying closing costs. The experience requirements have been modified to accommodate applicants such as small business and management and military with that experience it can count towards the management requirements for ownership loans while working with a mentor can modify or account towards the operating loan requirements. Operating loan repayment terms are one to seven years while ownership is up to 25 years. Guaranteed loans are made and serviced by agricultural lenders such as farm credit or your local bank. They are funded directly by the lender, whereas direct loan programs are funded through the U.S. Treasury. Guaranteed loans are often used to help lenders continue with customers who have experienced setbacks. To qualify for an FSA guarantee loan, an applicant must meet the general eligibility requirements, be unable to obtain the loan without a guarantee, and have a feasible plan and adequate collateral as determined by the lender. And the limit for this program, again, is $1,825,000. Guaranteed operating loans have one to seven year terms, while ownership loans are up to 40 years. The loan rate is determined by the lender, not FSA, 
and there is a loan guarantee fee with this program. For the down payment loan program, applicants must be beginning farmers, veteran or socially disadvantaged farmers and must provide a 5% down payment. Down payment loan funds may be used only to partially finance the purchase of a family farm. FSA can loan up to 45% of the lease of the purchase price of their appraised value or $667,000 meaning that the maximum loan amount is about $300,000. The balance of the purchase price not covered by the down payment loan and the loan applicant's down payment may be financed by a private lender, a cooperative, or the seller. And this program has a 20-year loan term. Farm storage facility loans provide low interest financing for producers to store, handle, and or transport eligible commodities they produce. This includes acquiring, constructing, or upgrading new or used, portable or permanently affixed on-farm storage and handling facilities. You could acquire a new or used storage and handling truck, and it could be used to acquire portable or permanently affixed storage and handling equipment. You can borrow up to $500,000 with a minimum down payment at 15% with terms up to 12 years. Or you may be able to borrow up to $50,000 for the FSFL microloan with a lower down payment at 5%. Producers must also demonstrate production history and document storage needs for eligibility. Examples of eligible crops include corn, grain sorghum, hay, honey, fruit, floriculture, eggs, meat, and poultry. FSA also has a youth loan program. So FSA's youth loan program makes low interest loans to eligible youth to start and operate income producing agriculture related projects. Depending on the type of project, Loan funds might be used for several different things. Youth can buy livestock, seed, equipment, and supplies, or they can buy, rent, or repair needed tools and equipment, and they can even pay operating expenses for the associated project. The maximum loan amount is $5,000, but that doesn't mean youth have to borrow all $5,000 at one time. It just means they can't have more than $5,000 borrowed at any given time. We also have the ability to split that $5,000 into a couple of different types of loans where you might get an annual operating loan for supplies or feed, or maybe even a 4-H animal. Then you might also have the opportunity to buy breeding livestock that maybe could be set up on a little bit of a longer term. It's going to help the youth build some credit with your local FSA office. And so if you ever have a goal of farming and ranching in the future and may want to eventually expand, starting their relationship with your local FSA office is going to be where this comes in. It's going to be their first start. So now that I've wrapped up the general overview of FSA programs, I will touch on a few other resources from our partner organizations that we work with that are also helpful. The Rural Development Loan Program is similar to FSA. However, the focus is to purchase and build homes in rural areas. They also provide um, direct and guaranteed loan programs for businesses. They also offer grant programs for agricultural producers through the Value Added Producer Grant and the Rural Energy for America program. The Value Added Producer Grant is used for adding value to products. And some possible examples would be grass-fed beef or organic. The Rural Energy for America program is used to make energy efficient improvements. This can be in the form of a loan or a loan grant combination. So for additional information on these, you can contact your local rural development office. Some more resources include those from the Agricultural Marketing Service, the AMS, 
is an agency that may be working to support your local markets. They provide local food and farmers market promotion grant funds for the development of local markets. They also have price report data and many other resources available online. Extension is a great partner of USDA and has significant information, programming, and support locally for producers. Hispanic-serving agricultural colleges and universities, such as UTRGV, are valuable resources for educational information. The Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, also known as FAIR, program is a decentralized competitive grant and education program operating in every state and island protectorate. FAIR is divided into four different regions that operate as separate entities and run grant programs for their states. You can learn more by visiting fair.org. So there are a few upcoming FSA program deadlines that I will take a chance to remind you of. The Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm Raised Fish Program applications for payments are due by January 30th, 2022. For this program, eligible producers must have a previously approved notice of loss for eligible 2021 losses. The Livestock Forage Disaster Program has applications for payments due by January 30th, 2022 in eligible counties for eligible 2021 losses. So to find out if your county is eligible, either contact your local office or visit fsa.usda dot gov forward slash tx where you can find additional information online and the organic and transitional education and certification program has applications that are due on february 4th 2022 wrapping up a few more resources that are available through fsa we do have um, translation services that are available for limited English proficient producers. It is FSA's policy to provide equal opportunity in all programs, services, and activities to LEP persons. LEP persons are individuals who do not speak English as their primary language and have a limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English. LEP statutes and authorities prohibit exclusion from participation in, denial of benefits of, and discrimination under federally assisted and or conducted programs on the grounds of race, color, or national origin. FSA offers three types of language translation and interpretation services available to customers at no cost. Document translation services are available if you need documents translated either into your language or if you need them translated from your language into English. Telephonic interpretation is also available. And so if you do visit your local FSA office, they do have instructions on how they can connect with an interpreter to be able to more effectively communicate with LEP persons. Each office also has an I speak card that allows LEP persons to identify their language so that way we can connect with an interpreter who can assist us in those conversations. In-person interpretation is also available. So these language translation and interpretation services will assist both customers and staff with overcoming language barriers. So it is important to note that if in-person translation services are required, to contact your local office ahead of time so proper arrangements can be made. FSA does provide Gov Delivery newsletters. Producers, owners, and others interested in keeping up to date with important FSA program deadlines and information are strongly encouraged to sign up for Gov Delivery. This instant communication system allows newsletters, deadline reminders, and bulletins to be sent right to your email address or cell phone. Producers can sign up online at fsa.usda 
www.gov forward slash subscribe for email communication. Producers can also text their two-digit state and their county name to 372-669 for text alerts. So for example, if you are in Bell County, Texas, you would text TX Bell, or if you are in San Saba County, Texas, you would text TX San Saba, all one word, to 372-669. This does conclude my presentation for today. This is my contact information here, so you can feel free to reach out to me by email or by phone. And you can also reach out to your local office for any questions that you may have. For those of you all that may have not visited an FSA office before, or you may be a new beginning farmer rancher, you can find your local service center online at farmers.gov forward slash service dash locator. All right. Thank you, Josh, uh, for all the valuable and helpful information that you just provided. Uh, it was actually quite impressive to see the wide variety of programs that USD offers, uh, especially that first part where, where you explain how to register with the uh, USDA and FSA is very important. We get a lot of questions from our clients on how to do that, but uh, you presented it very well and, and, and included everything that is needed for that. Sure. Um, so th we have a little bit of time for some questions, if that's okay with you. Yes, sir, we can uh, take some um, the questions the that we have. So um, we're going to start uh, with a question here. I'm going to read it. It's, it's a little bit long, but it says, FSA beginning and minority loans require three years of farm management experience. Is there any financial help or learning resources for people who didn't inher inherit land or live in an agricultural community where it's not easy to get that type of farm experience? Is there any programs for true beginning farmers? Three years of management on a production farm isn't exactly beginning by definition. Sure, so obviously, you know, a lot of beginning farmers and ranchers do come into it, um, maybe not having that previous experience in managing an operation. Um, one of the things that may be an option for some producers may be to seek out a mentorship with maybe some existing farmers or ranchers that they may know in their area. Um, in some other cases, there is an initiative called SCORE, and um, you can reach out to me directly, um, and I can get some additional information to you on that. But SCORE does allow um, beginning farmers and ranchers or those that want to increase their knowledge to partner with existing farmers and ranchers through that program. So they work to pair um, both a mentor and a mentee together to be able to build that experience um, there within um, to meet their requirements. And so again, there may be some other experience that you may also have as well that may translate over into some qualifying management experience, but that would be a determination that your farm loan um, officer, your farm loan manager would make. Um, and if any of that experience would be able to translate over. Um, but like I say, there may be some options there, but just reach out to me directly and I can get you a little bit more information on some resources that may be available. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question here. Does FSA have some type of relief program for a family in case of the sudden death of a farmer who is currently paying back a loan? If that is a situation, I'm not sure if you have reached out directly to your farm loan team. Um, but if you have not, that will be the definitely the first thing that you should do. Um, I won't get too far into detail since that is a sensitive matter. Um, but be sure to reach out to your local farm loan team to let them know what's going on and to see um, what options are available in that situation. And so obviously our condolences is there, um, but re reach out to your local FSA office and farm loan team for additional information on how you all can handle that situation. All right, thanks. Uh, next one, what is the lowest gross revenue of a small scale market garden vegetable farm to qualify legally as a farm so we can count it towards our three years farm management experience? So there may not necessarily be a lowest gross revenue, I guess, threshold that's there, um, but it, it that falls back into some of the experience that you have. And so a lot of our producers, again, I think as I mentioned during the presentation, um, do end up 
starting small and then scaling up. And so it may not be, um, again, that there, there's not a, yes, a minimum threshold for revenue, but um, it should be an operation that does show that it does cash flow so that you do at least generate enough revenue to cover all of the expenses that you do have. Um, there are some different resources that are available. I'm sure Sarah probably has some um, information on business planning that might be available to you. And then when you do work with your farm loan team, they can also work with you to make sure that you're capturing all of your um, expenses that you have, all of the projected revenue that you have as well, just to see if the operation will cash flow and what your goals are and what you're working to do. Okay. Thanks, uh, Josh. Uh, there is another question here. Um, someone asking, what's this? If you know what's the status on the loan forgiveness for minorities? So at this time, we do not have an update um, from where we are with last summer. Um, the program is in, is in pending litigation at this moment. So we do not have an update on um, the status of it at this time other than it is still in litigation. Um, the department, we do still work to um, finish making those offers as the program is currently structured by law. Um, to eligible producers under that program. So if the um, injunction is lifted at any point and FSA is authorized to move forward with those payments, then we'll be ready to do so. Um, but at this time, that program is still under a court injunction. We are prohibited from making any payments under that program until um, we're otherwise notified that we can if the injunction is lifted or in case any other congressional action changes that language. Um, but for that, you can be sure to find the latest information and any updates um, will be available online at farmers.gov. All right. Um, we still have a, a, a few other questions and we have a, 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 like four or five more minutes. Sure. Um, do FSA operating and ownership loans require business plans or financial projections? Yes, they do. Um, as part of the application process, you will have to, um, as part of the business plan portion of the application, you will project out what your income, uh, so what your revenue and, and projected expenses would be under that program. Um, depending on where you are, what type of operation you have, some things may be easier than, to project than other things may be. Um, but again, that does come to one of those um, places where um, your local FSA office, they can provide you with some technical assistance and maybe helping you to identify some of the information. But also um, extension may also have some information that's available as well to help you kind of project out what those in revenues and expenses may be as well. Um, but yes, they are a part of the application process. Okay, thanks. Uh... Uh, did any of the FSA farm program assist with pandemic related losses? Um, yeah, we there were some programs under the pandemic assistance for producers initiative that were for eligible producers that did suffer some losses related to the pandemic. Um, the most notable probably being the coronavirus food assistance program. Um, there were two signups, CFAP1 and CFAP2. Um, CFAP1 signup occurred in 2020. Um, CFAP2 sign-up occurred um, at the end of 2020 through 2021, and then was additionally extended last March to take to run through September, I believe. And so there was some assistance that was there through those programs. Um, the sign-up period for both those programs has since closed, and so producers are no longer able to um, apply for those programs at this time. Um, we do not know if there will be any additional assistance that will be coming um, under that initiative. But if there are additional programs that are announced, then we'll be sharing that information through our Gov Delivery newsletters and on our websites. And so um, if you don't currently, again, receive our Gov Delivery newsletters, be sure to sign up online so that you can uh, receive that information to receive important program updates for your local office. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to do one last one. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to do just a couple more. Uh, this is in reference of uh, one question that you already answered, and they have another question related to that. So does the three years of agricultural experience have to be in the same agricultural niche when you take the beginning farmer land loan? Can you get a beginning farmer land loan for a li livestock enterprise if your experience is as a market gardener? 
Oh, they will take into account the your home loan team and manager. They will take into account the experience that you have and whether it does translate over and is feasible for the project that you are wanting to do. Um, in some cases, um, I think I mentioned during the presentation, there is that borrower's training program, which does sometimes um, involve production education classes in either livestock or crop production. And so that may be an option depending on your individual situation. Um, but again, a, a lot of these decisions will kind of be up to the farm loan manager and your farm loan team. And a lot of these things they can't not definitively answer until they have a uh, complete loan application for you. But some of these things, um, it, it just really all depends on what your individual circumstances are and what may be able to work to meet the program requirements. All right. Well, the very last one is a, a simple one. Just someone is asking if FSA office can help can help them get a map of the or their farms. So if you currently have a farm number with FSA, then that is definitely something that they can assist you with. Um, so if you do have a farm number already, they can um, print off a map that shows the boundaries as we have it constituted in our systems. Now, if you don't currently have a farm number in our system, then we may not be able to provide that map to you because um, we don't have it already um, mapped off in our system. So in that case, we may not be able to. Um, but if you have worked with your local FSA office before and you have been issued a farm number, then that should be something that they can um, provide for you. Okay. Well, yes, we really thank you for all this uh, great information.